The Super NES lives again, briefly, on Super NES Works, episode 722. going to go wildly out of sequence with this video series for a moment, since it would normally take me about 15 years of weekly episodes to get to a 2017 Super NES release in proper chronological order. Please understand. Following on the heels of last year's eagerly demanded classic NES edition mini console, Nintendo has actually done something predictable for once in its existence and followed up with the next-gen model everyone expected. Lots of people speculated that the classics branding on the NES Mini's box, accompanied by an icon of the NES controller, indicated Nintendo's intent to create a running series of retro mini consoles. And hey, they were right. The Super NES Mini sticks largely to the template of its predecessor. It does cost a bit more, and it contains fewer games, which combined might come off a bit like gougery. On the other hand, this system's lineup lacks any inessential releases to make you shrug and say, why? Also, it contains a second controller, so you don't have to hunt fruitlessly for a way to let Player 2 join in, or worry about getting shackled with the flaky third-party solutions that dogged the NES Mini. So the question is, does the Super NES Classic Edition represent a worthwhile purchase, or is it in fact a bit of gougery? Putting aside the potential logistics of the system's availability, which doesn't really have anything to do with the product's innate quality, is this thing worth the 80 bones, or 79.80 yen, or disproportionately huge number of euros Nintendo is asking for it? I'm going to go ahead and say yes, if you have pretty much any nostalgia for Super NES games. Like the NES Mini, this hardly amounts to a comprehensive package of classics, but it's by far the most affordable way to play a bunch of Nintendo's 16-bit games on a modern television for a reasonable price. Assuming, of course, you can find it for a reasonable price. Okay, let's get that elephant out of the room. Nintendo hardware is always tough to find at launch, and if you can actually run down to a store and easily pick up a brand new Nintendo system, or quote-unquote brand new in this case, it's probably bad news. I've owned every Nintendo system since the NES during its original life, and the only consoles I've ever been able to find at launch without a hassle have been the GameCube, the 3DS, and the Wii U, all of which represent the low points in the company's hardware history. Yeah, they eventually corrected the 3DS's tailspin, but that's the exception. Nintendo employs very conservative distribution practices to help keep their books in the black, while simultaneously increasing the perception of scarcity and desirability for all its products. And these mini consoles are no exception. I'm not saying that's good, but Nintendo hardware shortages have been a grand tradition dating back all the way to the NES and, yeah, the Super NES. That's just how they operate, and no amount of fiery editorials or social media snark is going to change a business practice that continues to net sellout sales and breathless headlines. On the plus side, Nintendo of America boss Reggie fils has indicated the Super NES Mini will ship in larger quantities than its predecessor did, and its predecessor will be put back into circulation again next year, which bodes well for both systems' long-term availability. So please don't pay $250 for one of these systems on eBay. It can wait. Okay, with that out of the way, let's talk about the Super NES Mini. As with its predecessor, Nintendo has put an emulator and a curated selection of first- and third-party games into a shell that perfectly resembles a tiny version of a vintage console. Each region gets its own specific mini-shell, which means Americans get that weird ridge design with lots of purples versus the smooth gray lines and rainbow buttons of Europe and Japan. The American and European devices share a common lineup, even though the localized versions of several of these games only appeared in the US back in the day. The Japanese system features a few minor differences from the Western lineup, including Mystical Ninja instead of Super Castlevania 4 and Super Street Fighter 2 instead of Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Otherwise, though, there's a lot more parity between the 16-bit minis than there was for the 8-bit ones. And the games included here are all pretty much brilliant. The NES Mini's lineup of 30 included a lot of cute but flimsy vintage releases, as well as a few utterly unpalatable titles like the clumsy Ice Climber and Micronic's god-awful Ghost and Goblins conversion. Conversely, while I can think of a few dozen games I wish had been included on the Super NES Mini, there's not a single game here I'd want to see removed to make room for others. Please note that if you say Kirby's Dream Course, you're a bad person. In all regions, the Super NES Mini also contains a special 21st game, Star Fox 2, an infamously cancelled release from the console's latter days. 
Some early builds of Star Fox 2 have made their way online over the years, but programmer Dylan Cuthbert has long stated that there was a more complete and retail-ready version of the game hidden away in the Nintendo vaults than the leaked ROMs, and here's the proof. Honestly, the inclusion of Star Fox 2 alone makes the Super NES Mini an essential purchase for most Super NES fans, and it goes a long way to justify the $20 markup for 10 fewer games than we saw on the NES Mini. Bootleg carts of the incomplete Star Fox 2 have been circulating for 50 bucks or so for years. Now here's a legitimate release of the finished game, along with 20 genuine classics, on an adorable little mini console for less than twice that price. In fact, Star Fox 2 is such a big deal that it deserves a separate review, so please watch for that. As for the Super NES Classic Edition itself, it is every bit as much a faithful tribute to the original hardware and games as you could hope for. Though perhaps due to the complexity of the system's original hardware design, it does include a few compromises. First, the outward compromises. The NES Mini was a perfect recreation of the original system, minus the fact that the cartridge insertion slot panel didn't actually open, all the way down to the controllers that plugged into the front of the system. The Super NES used a different controller connector design than the NES. It was a rounded, elongated shape versus the NES's sloped rectangle. And that doesn't look as similar to the Wii remote extension connectors the Mini's controllers are based on. Rather than compromising the shelf appeal of the Super NES Mini's design with controller ports that break up its retro appearance, Nintendo instead tucked the actual controller ports behind a front panel that pops open behind a false front. Otherwise though, this is a perfect miniaturized imitation. The rear panel contains ports for the same USB power supply and HDMI you found on the back of the NES Mini, and all the little details are the same as on the original hardware, down to the tiny inset dots next to the controller ports that indicate which is player 1's input and which is player 2's. The power and reset buttons even feature the same sliding action on the US Mini model as on the full-size console. The controllers are essentially perfect full-sized recreations of original Super NES controllers too good build quality, great button response, all the stuff you'd want from a device like this. I'm almost positive Nintendo simply dredged up the original Super NES controller molds and threw in a few tweaks to make them compatible with a Wii Remote dongle connector standard. My first impression of the included controllers was that they felt more coarsely textured than they should, but I'm pretty sure that's just because it's been a long, long time since I've held a brand new Super NES controller that hasn't had its surface worn down by years of handling. As with the NES Mini, the controller cables feel entirely too short for their own good, but there'll be aftermarket extension cables and wireless connectors aplenty, so it's probably a minor issue. Normally I wouldn't dwell so long on appearances, but appearances are kind of the point here. And the Super NES Mini does its trick. The look of this thing is meant to stimulate retro gamer endorphins, and it does. In action, the Super NES Mini uses the same straightforward software interface as its predecessor. The games appear as a gallery of icons, and you can press the console's reset switch to jump back to the home menu, or save up to four suspend states for each game. Once again, Nintendo has elected not to incorporate manuals into the console for some weird reason. Instead, you scan a QR code with your phone to visit a website which, as of the time of this recording, hasn't actually been set live yet. So it looks and feels the part, but how well does the Super NES Classic Edition handle its games? The NES Mini was pretty close to perfect, though some people complained of minor audio issues and a perception of control lag. Those didn't really stand out to me with the NES, but I do notice them slightly more on this new model. But let's not blow this out of proportion. The Super NES Mini does come really close to perfectly recreating the look, feel, and sound of the original games. There is a tendency for gamers to fly into a histrionic rage about barely perceptible technical issues, but the Super NES Classic Edition's small discrepancies don't really merit that kind of reaction. This is better Super NES emulation than on any iteration of Virtual Console, and it holds up to or exceeds the quality of unofficial emulators. It absolutely puts unofficial devices like the Superboy or Retron 5 to shame. It's really solid. If you want to see a botch job, look to the shrieking audio defects of the retro bit generations or at games Sega Genesis mini consoles. That said, I do feel like there's a tiny bit of play lag affecting Super NES mini action games, though this amounts to my personal perception and shouldn't be taken as scientific technical analysis. Playing the likes of Contra 3 or Mega Man X on the Super NES Classic Edition honestly feels perfectly fine. But in alternating between mini titles and the same games played on real hardware on a CRT with zero latency, I found the original hardware to feel the tiniest bit more responsive. I suppose the real world test would be found in Super Punch Out and its need for split second responses to on screen cues, but I'm sorry to say I honestly don't have enough experience with that game to be a good judge. 
<laughs> so I will say that people who obsess about a frame or two of latency will find cause to complain here. But anyone who has gotten used to playing Super NES on Virtual Console or on other emulators can expect an experience consistent with or superior to those platforms. Graphically, the Super NES Mini's output looks great. The hardware can once again only output at 720p, which means the games scale up cleanly to three times their original resolution with a slight border. You have a few different display options to choose from, but admirably, Nintendo offers no way to force the graphics to stretch to fill the TV's vertical resolution, or worse, stretch horizontally to the width of the entire HD picture. Instead, the mini console offers a number of different frame images in the Super Game Boy tradition. My personal favorite is the wood grain speaker set, which creates a charming illusion of playing those old games on an old television. You can also choose among three different ways to display the game graphics. For those who prefer perfect crispness, you can play at true pixel resolution, which results in clean graphical edges while slightly distorting the image along the horizontal axis from its intended design. For 3 mode is a closer simulation of how the games were designed to be seen. Super NES games are inherently proportioned at 16 to 15, so activating 4 to 3 mode stretches the image to make it slightly wider, and it creates some softness as pixels are interpolated to mimic the proportions of vintage tube televisions. But it's worth it. You don't want an oblong Kirby, do you? Finally, there's a simulated CRT filter image, which is fine, I guess. CRT filters can help soften and break up the harshness of emulated pixels on digital screens, so this mode may make the games a little easier on your eyes. However, compared to the larger array of filter options included in something like Digital Eclipse's Disney Afternoon Collection or on an NES clone console like the Analog NT Mini, this one fixed option seems pretty lacking. I will say though that the Super NES Mini perfectly captures the look of the games. I haven't noticed any graphical defects or distortion, even in advanced titles like Yoshi's Island and Star Fox. Even when I think I notice new glitches, like the way portions of the highway flicker away when the gunships smash into the road in Mega Man X's introductory stage, a quick check against direct feed reference footage proves those errors were there all along. There are some pretty advanced 16-bit games utilizing powerful enhancement chips on this mini console, and all of them look pretty much perfect. Unfortunately, I can't say the same holds true for the audio. The Super NES Mini renders visuals flawlessly, and if there's any control lag, it's so negligible that I might be imagining it. But sound is always going to be the hardest part of any effort to recreate the Super NES experience, and even Nintendo's own engineers haven't managed to pull it off perfectly here. The original console incorporated a custom Sony-made sound processor unlike anything used in any other game system ever, one based around audio samples and real-time filtering and distortion. The Sony chip gave the Super NES its unique soundscape. Some find it warm and comforting, others find it muffled and weak. But in any case, no other console sounds quite like the Super NES, and it's really tough to get right. I will say that I've heard some pretty awful efforts to emulate the Super NES audio through the years, and this isn't one of them. To a casual ear, the music will sound totally fine. If the last time you played Yoshi's Island on real hardware was 1996, you'll be totally satisfied with how it sounds here. It's only when you stop and really listen side by side to audio from a real Super NES that you might notice some issues. I found this system demonstrated the greatest amount of trouble on the title screen to Final Fantasy III. That game opens with long sustained chords of a simulated pipe organ, the sort of very particular sustained sound that can be tough to imitate perfectly. And if you compare the FF intro on Super NES Mini to the same music played on real hardware, it's hard not to notice that the mini console plays it back a little too stridently, a little bit too high pitched, maybe slightly thin. And once you hear it there, you'll notice it other places too. I find the audio inconsistencies seem most common in games that include their own custom sound samples or feature a lot of clear high notes. Zero's hard rockin' fake electric guitar theme in Mega Man X, for example, always walks a delicate tightrope between rat as hell and shrill, and here it tips very slightly towards shrill. As with the system's other quirks, these amount to minor matters that won't affect the majority of fans' experiences. 
But if you're obsessed with finding a perfect simulation of Super NES games, the Mini won't be 100% to your liking. That said though, for $80, this is a heck of a package. Even disregarding the never-before-released Star Fox 2, acquiring all 20 of these games in their original cartridge form would set you back upwards of $500. Buying them all on Virtual Console would cost nearly twice as much as the system on its own, and I say nearly simply because not all of these games have appeared on Virtual Console before. Both Star Fox and the original version of Yoshi's Island have frustratingly been missing in action from Virtual Console for more than a decade, meaning the only way to play the games has been to buy the carts or emulate them. We've always assumed technical or legal issues associated with their add-on SuperFX coprocessor chips have prevented them from making their way to Virtual Console. So for Nintendo to bring these two 16-bit classics back into circulation after being out of print for two decades is a huge boon. Altogether, the system's included library consists of a strong selection of first and third party titles. We've been writing about the Super NES Mini Library at Retronauts.com over the past few weeks. If you're curious to know more about the games, you can check it out there. But here's a quick rundown. Contra 3 is a completely bonkers run-and-gun game that manages to balance the design of early Contra games with the constant boss parades of the later games. Donkey Kong Country is not as good as its sequel, but I get that this is on Super NES Mini because of its sheer impact. It made Donkey Kong a major character again in a visually impressive platformer that kept the Super NES in the fight long enough for Nintendo to get N64 up and running. Earthbound is a cult RPG defined by a complex mixture of whimsy and nostalgia. Beneath its superficial wackiness, Earthbound possesses a sober wistfulness about the prospect of growing up. Final Fantasy III, or Final Fantasy VI, is an enormous RPG that encompasses more than a dozen of playable characters, an intricate skill system, and the literal end of the world. F-Zero is probably the weakest game on the system. It made for an impressive graphical showcase at the time of its debut, but its speed can't counter the fact that it's a strictly single-player racing game. Conversely, Kirby's Dream Course could be the most underappreciated game on the system. It's an imaginative take on golf, featuring the rules and mechanics of the Kirby franchise. Kirby Superstar is packed with content. It's a Kirby adventure with a little bit of everything, races, minigames, and even a mid-sized Metroidvania adventure. Mega Man X is a strong contender for best Mega Man game ever. It introduces tons of new mechanics to go along with its new cast of heroes and villains, and it absolutely drips with attention to detail. Secret of Mana is a gorgeous three-player action RPG, and it holds up pretty well after all these years. That said, if there's a way to get a third player hooked up to play this version, I don't know what it is. Star Fox. Uh, while its low frame rate and simple polygonal graphics absolutely date this shooter, it's still fun and challenging and packed with remarkable personality, despite its minimalist look. <laughs> And Star Fox 2 is a vast upgrade over the original Star Fox, featuring more characters, multiple combat modes, a real-time strategy element, and more. Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo is the most influential fighting game ever, and this is arguably its most refined home version. None of the new challengers are on tap here, but boy does it move fast. Super Castlevania 4 does not move fast. It's a deliberate atmospheric reimagining of the vampire battling NES hits, 
and it has a great soundtrack. Super Ghouls and Ghosts is a much improved sequel to the janky NES port of an arcade classic, but despite its technical improvements, it's still brutal as heck. Super Mario Kart is an improvement on the F-Zero concept that slows down the action, adds two-player support, and turns the whole thing into a free-for-all battle featuring Mario characters. Super Mario RPG is from the studio behind Final Fantasy, and they offer their take on the world of Mario here. While this inspired future Mario RPGs down to its emphasis on timed button presses and turn-based combat, its story and visuals bear a little resemblance to Mario & Luigi or Paper Mario. Super Mario World is a slower, more exploratory take on classic Mario platforming. It may not be as gleefully inventive as Super Mario Bros. 3, but it's arguably much deeper. Super Metroid is one of Nintendo's crowning achievements, a return to form for the series after the oddball second game. Any trivial design complaints you may have about it, like Samus' floaty jump, vanish in the face of its towering achievements in structure, narrative, and respecting the player. Super Punch-Out! is a more faithful rendition of the original arcade game than the popular NES title. It features the same great gameplay along with some of the finest character animation on the system. The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past is a lot like Super Metroid in that it's the third Zelda game. It saw the original game's design team return to create a pitch-perfect take on their older work. Action RPGs continue to base their design on A Link to the Pasts here in the year 2017. And finally, Yoshi's Island, a clever spin on the Mario concept that put an advanced 3D coprocessor to use for creating more fluid, more artful 2D world. It's slower and more exploratory than even Super Mario World, but it bursts endlessly with imagination from start to finish. There's no denying the appeal of the painless, plug-and-play gaming experience the Super NES Mini offers. Unlike a DIY RetroPie or other similar device, the Super NES Mini takes about a minute to set up, and then you're off and running. Its game lineup is great, the emulation is excellent if not quite perfect, and the hardware itself is both charming and well-built. It makes for a great primer to some of the best Nintendo releases of the early 90s, or of course as a nostalgia piece. I can't really find much cause for complaint here. Yeah, the audio is a little off, and maybe there's a hint of lag. And sure, these 20 games only represent a small slice of the full breadth of the Super NES catalog. Ultimately, the biggest weakness with the system is the same one that dogged the NES Mini, what you see is what you get. The Super NES Classic Edition lacks any means to add extra games beyond the 21 included in the box, but it's a great overview of the best games we'll see in the years ahead on Super NES Works. It brings several long-absent classics back into circulation, and it finally drags the long-lost Star Fox 2 into the light of day. All of this in a self-contained, multiplayer-friendly plug-and-play package that costs less than a limited edition of a single 2017 AAA blockbuster game. I understand why Nintendo put a limited selection of games in a closed box. No upgrade mechanism keeps costs down, makes the device idiot-proof, and gives them room to release a second model with additional or alternate games at some point, but it is still a letdown. I'm sure someone will jailbreak the thing in no time flat to figure out how to inject ROMs in it, but it would be nice to have the option to use this thing to play Chrono Trigger legally. So it's not perfect, but it's still quite excellent all told. If you care at all about classic games, there's really no reason not to pick up a Super NES Classic Edition. Assuming you can actually find one, I mean. There's always a catch. Next episode on Super NES Works, how did Star Fox 2 turn out anyway? Let's find out. <laughs>